Hello and welcome to our IVF webinar once again. It's uh, 5 p.m. UK time, so it's a bit different time, but I hope that you are ready to learn a bit more. And of course, as always, ask your questions. And we are here once again with a wonderful uh, Dr. Anna Fosquilin. I am very happy to have you back. It's been a while, so thank you so much for joining us once again. Dr. Anna, how are you feeling tonight? Very well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. How are you? <laughs> Everything fine? Yes, I am very happy to have you here for sure. And uh, I just want to mention that, uh, as I mentioned actually already, sorry, uh, Dr. Anna has been with us already. And there was another topic that she uh, prepared last time. It was, I remember, on PRP. This time she will uh, be talking about understanding fertility and ovulation. And of course, we will start with Dr. Anna's presentation on that topic. And uh, afterwards, as always, you will have a chance to ask your questions. You can do it now, later on. And I'm sure Dr. Anna will be happy to answer any of the questions that you will have. And uh, Dr. Anna is uh, a specialist in obstetrics, gynecology and reproductive medicine, of course, at Repro Clinic, which is located in beautiful Barcelona. So um, thank you so much once more. And I guess, um, yeah, let's, let's go ahead with our presentation. And uh, yeah, are you ready to begin, Dr. Anna? Ready to begin, yes. <laughs> let's start then. Thank you so much. And let me put the presentation here. Okay, so tonight's topic is uh, understanding fertility and ovulation. So it's a guide for patients trying to, to conceive. I will try to explain some different things about it and I will try to, to be clear and, and to, to answer all the questions that you have. So let's start uh, with uh, some uh, different, some, some general aspects of fertility that I normally explain to the patients uh, when I have them here in, in the fertility clinic. So the first thing that we should know, uh, probably uh, you have heard about it before, women are born with a certain ovarian reserve and this ovarian reserve decreases with age and this decrease is more important after the age of 35, 37 and uh, also it goes related to a decrease in terms of the oocyte quality of the egg Quality. Okay, so we can test uh, the ovarian reserve, the total <coughs> amount of reserve, but we cannot test the, the egg quality, okay? There's no test to see it. So what we do know is after 40 years old, um, there's a difficulty in getting pregnant, a higher uh, rate of miscarriages and more chromosomal abnormalities in embryos. We do know that. And this goes related uh, with, the, with the age. Uh, and what can we test? So what are the ovarian reserve tests that we have? FSH and estradiol. Actually, the FSH is the one that is important, but we need the estradiol to interpret the, the FSH levels. Uh, this is uh, depending on the moment of the cycle. Uh, I always tell my patients that it's like uh, the fuel of the ovaries. And if it's too high, it means that this ovary is not working properly and needs more fuel. Okay, so high FSH is not a good thing. Okay. Uh, then we have the AMH, which is produced by uh, preantral and small angel follicles, and uh, it can be tested in any moment of the cycle. And it gives us an idea of the total amount of ovarian reserve that we have. And um, then we have, of course, the ultrasound, which is uh, doing what's called the antral follicle count. What is that? So we know that in the beginning of our cycles, uh, we have different follicles that could grow. Uh, in response to the hormones and that we can see with the ultrasound because they have a, li a little bit of liquid, okay? Um, so if we count the number of antral follicles that we have in the ovaries, we can have an idea of, of how the ovarian reserve is. And what happens in a natural cycle? Uh, we have different follicles available to grow, as I said, but just one of them will grow in response to the hormones because we don't have hormones to make all of them grow. Okay, so we will lose uh, the other ones and actually we know that every month we lose uh, a lot of follicles, even if you're not uh, ovulating, then we lose also a lot of follicles every month. And the development of the follicles, uh, I want to say that it's not just uh, 14 days that I will explain you later, but it starts three, four months before uh, the ovulation. So it's important to know it because everything that we can change in our lifestyle could 
could have an impact on that, okay? And, um, and these phases of the follicles uh, are divided into phases. One is the independent of the hormones, and the other one is dependent of the hormones, is the one that we are going to see uh, during these 14 days before ovulation, that is the growth of the follicle and the ovulation, okay? Saying that, uh, how does this work? How is this controlled? So there's the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, uh, so the menstrual cycle is regulated at the central nervous system, okay? So some people say, how comes that I have uh, menstruations every 28 days or 32? How does my body know when uh, I, I need to have my menstruation, okay? So here we have the explanation. It is uh, regulated uh, by the central nervous system. And uh, the first level will be the hypothalamus. Uh, that produces GnRH, which stands for gonadotropin releasing hormone. And it produces this uh, GnRH pulses that will vary in frequency and amplitude and will stimulate uh, the gonadotropins, uh, sorry, will stimulate uh, the anterior uh, pituitary gland to produce gonadotropins, which are the FSH and LH. FSH uh, stands for uh, follicle stimulating hormone and LH for luteinizing hormone. And these hormones are going to stimulate the ovaries and the ovaries are going to produce uh, several hormones that will also have an impact on the other previous uh, cycles, uh, phases of the cycle, sorry. So it will have an impact on the production of GnRH in the hypothalamus and also in the production of FSH. And that's kind of a, a circle that happens and that is, uh, is in that way to, to control all the cycle, okay? That's the way in which the, our body controls everything with feedbacks, of positive feedback, negative feedback in different structures of our system. And also, uh, let's say that some external stimuli could affect the hypothalamus and could change uh, this axis, like stress, lack of sleep, uh, sudden weight loss, or excessive exercise. And all this could create irregularity in, uh, in our menses. So now, let's go to the genital tract. Let's be a little bit more... Uh, in that point, okay? So I will divide it in two phases, two different things. The follicular development, which is the development of the follicle in the ovary. Uh, and then the other part is the endometrial development, which is the uh, growing of the lining of the endometrium that is inside the, the uterine cavity and that, uh, that will grow and, and then that will actually create the menstruation if we don't get pregnant, okay? So, uh, with uh, cycles of 21 or 35 days, uh, usually we think that they are ovulatory, so that we have an ovulation in them. So what happens normally in a, in a cycle? Uh, first of all, as I said, we have different follicles available to grow and they're like uh, uh, fighting for the FSH hormone. Um, and then the FSH levels go a little bit down and one follicle is selected like the dominant uh, follicle and we lose the other ones and this one is the one that's going to uh, grow and it's going to ovulate later okay and while this is growing this uh, this follicle is growing it produces estrogens estrogens and these estrogens as you can see will uh, increase progressively and the impact of the estrogens on the endometrial development will be that after menstruation starts the uh, proliferative phase of the endometrium that is in response of these estrogens that produces this follicle, the endometrium lining will grow, okay? Then also these estrogens, this peak of estrogens will create the peak of LH and FSH and the LH is the one that's going to be the one responsible for the ovulation, okay? Um, and after this peak, we will have the ovulation. The egg uh, will travel uh, to the tube, to the fallopian tube. We have, if we have uh, sexual intercourse, the spermatozoids will swim up until the tube. And uh, if there's fertilization, the embryo will be um, produced in the tube and then will travel until the uterine cavity in, in, in there. Uh, he will implant on the endometrium, okay? So what happens after the ovulation? Apart from that, what happens in the ovary, we will have a scar in the ovary, which is the corpus luteum that produces progesterone. 
So what we see is that after ovulation, the progesterone is going to rise, okay? And this progesterone will be also responsible for changing the endometrium, okay? So giving a maturation of the endometrium so that the endometrium can receive uh, the embryo and let the embryo implant, okay? So that would be more or less what happens in uh, our cycles. And now some tips about ovulation and fertilization. So ideally, to have a general idea of what we have to do um, to try to conceive, okay? Uh, we, we should have uh, sexual intercourse as close to ovulation as possible, it's, it, but it's true that uh, we are not a clock, so it's not easy to know exactly when you're ovulating. So you should know that ovulation takes place approximately uh, 14 days before your period. And I say before your period because we know that the luteal phase, which is the phase after the ovulation, normally it's very stable. So we know that um, 14 days before uh, the ovulation takes place. Okay, In longer periods, for example, or shorter periods, what normally varies is the follicular phase. Okay, So that's why we count from the menses uh, 14 days uh, before. Okay. So uh, another important thing to, to know is that the egg has the possibility of, of surviving for 12 or 24 hours, okay? And that sperm can survive between two and five days in the female genital tract. So therefore, um, it is recommended to start intercourse at least four or five days before the middle of the cycle, okay? Uh, and then, or, or actually the date in which you think you're going to ovulate approximately, so that the sperm is waiting for, for the egg eh? and to have sexual intercourse every other day or even also day. Mm -hmm. Some different things that you can check, some signs of ovulation that uh, we can see. Uh, on one hand, to time the ovulation to see when we are ovulating and to, to see when we uh, could have uh, sexual intercourse with the best chances, we can look at the vaginal discharge. So uh, normally, uh, right before uh, ovulation, because we have this peak of estrogens, we have a, um, a vaginal discharge that is uh, clear and stretchy, okay? This is something that we can see, but of course it can vary if we have any infection uh, or anything, or I mean, if, if it can change a little bit, it's not very, very accurate, but it's something that you can look at. And we can look at also at other natural signs like uh, pelvic discomfort, a little bit of pain, some people uh, feel it when they are ovulating, okay? Uh, also, some people tell, tell that they have emotional changes. Uh, it's also described an increased uh, libido, okay, which is uh, um, very normal, actually. It should be like that. Naturally, uh, knows a lot and is wise. Okay. Um, and then other things that happens uh, uh, during uh, or quite soon before ovulation are the LH and estrogen peak that we could test with different within blood, in urine, etc. And then uh, also with serial ultrasounds, we could you, we could see how this follicle is growing and how, how it is uh, close to the ovulation, okay? And things that, uh, that you could see after ovulation, okay? So after ovulation, we know that, it's, so these ones are the ones to, to know a little bit more about yourself, to know your body a little bit better. What we do know is that uh, the body temperature will increase because the corpus luteum, that was this car that I told you in the ovary uh, after ovulation, produces progesterone and this stimulates the central nervous system to increase the temperature of the body. Okay, And then also uh, we can test progesterone levels in mid luteal phase, which is um, seven days um, after ovulation and see if it's positive or not. And with that, we can be sure that if we have ovulated or not. Another thing um, that we could do at home, actually, you know, what could we do at home? The LH tests um, that are based on the detection of the LH surge in urine. And actually, this must be done from four or five days before the middle of the cycle or before uh, the time that you uh, think that you're going to ovulate. So it would be great to charter some previous months uh, to, having, to take in consideration these 14 days um, previous to the menstruation so that you can count more or less um, in which days you normally are ovulating, okay? And then, ideally, it would be uh, done every 12 hours or 24 hours um, to avoid uh, missing shorter peaks, okay? With, with 12, every 12 hours, probably, we will uh, see the peak. 
And also, um, another thing that we should know is that there are false negative uh, because of short peaks. So the, the peak is so short that we miss it in the, with this test. And also, it depends on the accuracy of the test. And also that there are false positives, which means that you have a positive test, but you are not ovulating. When can this happen? In patients with a polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, we can see some patients that have uh, elevated LH levels from the beginning of the cycle. So they can have uh, a very long LH uh, positive test, and it doesn't mean that they're ovulating. Okay? And also in menopause in uh, premature ovarian failure, could, we could have also a positive LH test during all the days. Why? Because as I said, um, FSH and actually also LH are like the fuel of the, of the ovaries. And if the ovaries are not working at all, like in menopause on, or premature ovarian failure, um, our central nervous system will uh, give more fuel. So the LH will increase a lot and will give a false positive test, okay? So it's better to see, to test, uh, with uh, these urine tests that see the estrogen levels and the LH levels, okay? Because then we will find the estrogen peak and the LH peak. And it, this uh, means that we are going to ovulate. So now, uh, preparation for fertility, a little bit of lifestyle. Um, what would I say in general? Uh, carry out a lifestyle as healthy as possible. So variety of uh, uh, diet, fresh food, unprocessed foods, uh, avoid toxics, of course, and, uh, and avoid also sedentary lifestyle uh, that can have an impact. So do a moderate physical exercise. Have a little bit of uh, activity, okay? Uh, if you have any medical conditions or any medical problem, contact your doctor because it could be interesting. It would be very interesting to, to be sure that you are on the best conditions to try to conceive. And if you need any change on the medication or anything like that, it would be interesting to do it and before. Uh, also, um, there are other types of treatments that have been postulated to, as possible aids for, for quality improvement of the eggs, but this is more for assisted reproductive techniques like uh, melatonin, CoQ10, all these things, but there's no uh, a strong, consistent uh, scientific evidence uh, to to say that it, it really helps a lot, okay, to change the quality or possibilities of achieving a pregnancy, and at least not in, 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 in normal fertility, okay, in, in trying naturally at home, okay. And another interesting thing I would say is that there are no differences in positions during sexual intercourse, uh, nor staying in supine position after having uh, sexual intercourse, okay, so no differences uh, in pregnancy rates. So after that, about diet, which is very important. So all these lifestyle things, I mean, are important because everything that we can change uh, before will help the, can help the quality of the eggs and can increase our chances, okay? But it's true that Viet um, has not demonstrated that it can uh, improve a lot, a lot, the quality of the eggs or things like that. But it's, it's something that we think it's important to, to have a, a very varied and equilibrated diet, uh, to eat uh, complex uh, carbohydrates, more rice, potatoes, things like that, uh, monounsaturated fats, uh, omega fatty acids, fresh vegetables and fruits, nuts, cereals, blue fish, also meat, okay, better uh, eat things that are organic. And it's very important, the uh, folic acid, mm, vitamin B6 and B12. I mean, it's more, um, what I want to say is, is related to B12. In vegan people, they can have a, a lack, a, um, a deficiency of, of B12 vitamin. So um, it's important to supplement uh, with this vitamin. Um, normally they are supplemented vegan people, okay? With vegetarian people, it's not a problem because they take uh, eggs and, and dairy, so it should not be a problem. Um, and then another thing is avoid what I had said, no? uh, avoid processed foods, saturated fats, sugary drinks, so have a healthy diet. And talking about folic acid, which is very important, okay, so that's the thing that I will tell you that you need to, to uh, start before uh, trying to conceive, okay. Uh, folic acid is very important for the nervous system formation for the closure of the neural tube. And this happens early uh, during pregnancy. 
So uh, uh, it's important to have these levels correct before, okay, before knowing we are pregnant. Uh, where can we find it? In green leafy vegetables, citrus, uh, legumes, liver, seafood, bluefish, uh, but more in vegetables than in foods of animal origin. And another thing is it's better to steam or eat uh, crude or raw uh, these vegetables than cook or freeze them because uh, the amount of folic acid can decrease. And then what I, I told you, right? So it's important to start a preconception multivitamin or a folic acid supplement to make sure that the levels are correct uh, when you're looking for a pregnancy. Weight. Uh, so weight is also important. Uh, what uh, what we counsel is to have a normal BMI. Um, so it should be between 18 and 25. Okay. What I just told you, variations in diet have not actually been shown and influence on the results more in, in, in assisted reproductive techniques. Okay. Because uh, we have more data on that. Uh, but what has been shown to improve the results is having a correct BMI before ART. What we do know is with patients with normal fertility, right? In patients with very low BMI, we could have an ovulation problems because your body uh, thinks that you're under stress, you don't have enough food, okay? Um, so actually, um, that's the reason why you don't ovulate because the body thinks that it's not the best condition to uh, get pregnant, okay? And in obese patients, what we can find is uh, irregular periods. Obese would be more than 30 of BMI, okay? So we can have irregular periods, increased risk of insulin resistance, uh, more uh, miscarriage rates, complications during pregnancy, okay? And more complicated deliveries. So it's recommended to uh, contact a nutritionist when we have uh, an abnormal uh, body mass index. So to try to, to have the best conditions um, and, and, and to have the best outcomes, right? also do for pregnancy, actually giving birth, all of that. And now about vitamin D. So what we have about vitamin D, I don't know what we cannot see it, but I will explain it. So we can get the vitamin D uh, with uh, the food intake, okay? But this is normally insufficient. It will be uh, liver cuts or things like that, okay? It's, it's, I always remember my, my dad from, from the Netherlands and he always uh, tell me that when he was little, his mom gave him uh, um, liver, cod liver, and it was uh, horrible <laughs> to supplement the vitamin D, okay? And the other uh, source that we have of vitamin D is the sun, okay? So that's why this, uh, we have this picture of the sun. Um, and we, we synthesize the vitamin D in our skin in response to the, uh, to the ultraviolet rays, okay? So the best thing would be at least uh, being uh, 30 minutes uh, under the sun, okay? With uh, arms and legs exposed or back also to try to have a, a good level. And actually it's important because it, it has a, an important role in uh, phosphocalcium metabolism, in uh, immunological uh, um, aspect system, okay? We know that it, it has a, an important role and that it also can have an, an important role in, in fertility eh? because it can have an impact. It could have an impact on natural fertility and also in the quality of the eggs and when we do assisted reproductive techniques in the implantation uh, rates that we can have. And normally uh, we try to have levels of more than, than 30 that would be, be the correct levels. If it's under 30, uh, we normally treat it. Uh, but we know actually what has been demonstrated is that lower than 20 uh, uh, is, is what can give us a little bit more problems uh, regarding to fertility. Okay, but less than 30, we normally uh, treat it because it's easy and it's, uh, it's, it's not harmful. Of course, we need to, to continue testing if it, this, this, this supplement of vitamins is correct. We normally give like 2,000 uh, 2, units more or less, okay? And, uh, or 1,000, it depends on the levels that we see and, and all the, 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 how quickly you want to resolve that, okay? And of course, that uh, what I was saying, we normally test these levels 
uh, every four ways or something like that to make sure that the levels are correct and not, not too high. I didn't see any patient with too high uh, levels, but still, I mean, it's a supplement, so it's good to control it. About alcohol and drugs. So about alcohol, um, it can have an inhibitory effect uh, at the central nervous system, and this can have an effect on the at the testicular level, irregular menses, quality of the oocytes. It could also have a man uh, an increased it can create an increased DNA fragmentation of the spermatozoids, so that the genetic material of the spermatozoids is, is altered, it's fragmented, okay, and it, this could be related with more miscarriage rates. It could have an impact on morphology and count, okay. Uh, what we know is it is not. Uh, what, what we know is that it is dose dependent, okay. So it, it depends on how much you drink. Uh, from eight weeks, it, it could be uh, a, a, um, from eight weeks, um, eight units a week, sorry, um, of alcohol, it could have a negative impact, as I am telling, okay. One small glass of wine is 1.5 units, more or less. So actually, uh, it's, it's something a little bit, I mean, controversial. I mean, all these negative effects have been demonstrated in very high uh, levels. So low levels of, of uh, alcohol during the week, I mean, like moderate intake, uh, it's necessarily not going to have a big impact on fertility, okay? So I would say like um, once a week, drink a glass of wine and things like that, it should not be very important. So that's what I counsel my, my patients, okay? Um, but uh, it is true that during pregnancy, I totally, uh, Absolutely, we should avoid it, okay? Because it can create malformations on the embryos. It can uh, it can give problems. So um, it's very important to avoid it during pregnancy. That's something that we do know, uh, and we, we know that it, it can have a big impact. And then talking about uh, other kind of drugs, marijuana, cocaine, and androgen steroids, they can also negatively impact uh, the gonadal function. So these axes that I were, uh, was talking about before, can be altered by this and then also we can find uh, problems with uh, motility and morphology of sperms in men. In women we can have ectopic pregnancy, miscarriages, uh, less embryos to transfer when we are doing ART techniques or so assisted reproductive techniques okay and cocaine also what we have seen is uh, that it's uh, during pregnancy it's something uh, very that could be a big, big problem, okay? It could give uh, miscarriage and, uh, and abruptive placenta, so very important problems with placenta and, and, and to do uh, a C-section, urgent C-section, okay? So it's something that we need to avoid all these drugs. And another interesting point is that um, androgen steroids can uh, create azospermia. What is that? Azospermia is the lack of spermatozoids in the, in the sperm sample. And the androgen steroids can be found in, uh, there are some, some uh, men that go a lot to the gym and want to uh, make grow their, their muscles a lot. So if they take uh, any supplement with steroids, it could, this could have an impact on the axis that I were explaining. So they can have a negative uh, impact and they can inhibit the function of the testicles, okay? So that's why we cannot see uh, spermatozoids on the sperm and normally it's, it's something that, is re that we can reverse, okay? And then related with caffeine, uh, we should avoid um, excessive intake. Mm -hmm. It is uh, something that it's a little bit controversial, but we always say like one or two coffees a day would be okay for our patients. Um, and it could have a, an impact if we take a lot of, a lot of uh, coffees uh, in DNA fragmentation of the sperm, of the spermatozoids, and this could be related also with miscarriages. So smoking, uh, we do know also uh, that smoking can have a, a negative impact on, on, uh, on the quality of the, of the eggs, on the gonadal uh, function, uh, in follicular development. What we know in general, in general fertility, uh, is that it can decrease the ovarian reserve. It's clear, I mean, smoking has a clear impact on fertility. Okay, and also we can found, uh, we have seen that uh, patients that smoke, uh, probably will have their menopause before patients that don't smoke. 
Okay. And it can also uh, have an impact on tubal function. Of course, during pregnancy, it can create more pregnant, more miscarriages during pregnancy. Placental dysfunction, that means that the placenta doesn't work um, correctly. So uh, the embryo and, and the baby doesn't grow uh, as it should be. And uh, in assisted reproductive techniques, uh, it could, uh, we could have uh, less oocytes and less quality embryos. And then in men, of course, this oxidative stress that uh, can affect women and men. In men, uh, what creates is a DNA uh, fragmentation again of the spermatozoids, and this can create lower progressive motility. The progressive motility is the one that the ones that are moving ahead. Okay, so the spermatozoids can move uh, vibrating or doing cycles. The ones that are interesting are the ones that go ahead. Okay, this is the progressive motility. And also, it could lead to an embryo blockage, lower quality embryos, lower pregnancy rates. So now, about stress and exercise. Uh, so chronic stress could have any, uh, an impact on, uh, on our general axis, on, on our uh, central nervous system and it could have uh, a decrease in the hypothalamic function, okay, in the GnRH, and it can also decrease the libido, okay, which is also very important for natural fertility. Mm -hmm. uh, and in psychological stress, actually, in assisted reproductive techniques, the implication um, has not been clearly demonstrated, and I think it's because it's not that easy to, to do um, big randomized trials with psychological um, tests with patients. I mean, probably, it, that's why we don't have strong evidence that it can affect or not, okay? But we do know that in in uh, specific patients, um, it can have an impact and, and, and more in, in assisted reproductive techniques, there's a lot of emotional uh, involvement. So uh, they probably would need a, a help from a coach, psychologist. So um, it's important to try to manage it with something that we like to do, like, I don't know, exercising, for example, that is the next point or reading a book or doing a bath or whatever that can relax us and that can help us to, to be a little bit less stressed, okay? And exercise, uh, I would say do a moderate exercise and not extenuating, uh, so not strenuous, because um, it can help regulate menstruation, so we, we it's good to be active, um, and especially in overweight or obese patients with, with polycystic ovarian syndrome, and because in that patients, a little bit of, of exercise can also help to reduce insulin resistance. And also, of course, it can help with the, with the BMI of the patient. And then uh, also know that if it's too much or too extenuating, um, it can create irregular cycles or, or amenorrhea. Amenorrhea is the lack of the, of the menses. And it can also modificate some seminal parameters. Okay, so it's good to, to be moderate and be active, actually. Mm -hmm. When you're trying to conceive uh, and, and naturally or with assisted reproductive techniques. And then also say that men should avoid cycling uh, uh, a lot of hours and actually more in mountain and things like that because it can impact the scrotal zone. So that could have a, a negative impact. So that's a recommendation actually. And also avoid high temperature, which is not exercise, but it can come after exercise. So avoid sauna, okay? Um, because um, it's better to don't have uh, very high temperatures uh, in the scrotal zone, in the testicles. And uh, also, let's say that exercise is very important physically, but also it's something that can help us uh, emotionally, okay, to manage all the stress that we, we could have. And what happens if we don't have a success? Um, so you should contact a gynecologist 12 months after trying to conceive six months after trying uh, from 35 years onwards, because age is an important factor. And also before, if there's uh, some known problem, uh, like endometriosis, inflammatory pelvic disease, male factor, or other diseases that could have an impact in fertility. So to summarize a little bit everything, um, just try to have a, a healthy lifestyle, so variety uh, diet, uh, a little bit of exercise, try to stay active, avoid toxics, probably one or two coffees a day would not make any difference or one uh, unit of alcohol um, 
I mean, once in a week, something like that probably would not have a, a big impact as well. Um, uh, try to do what, what I said, a, a little bit of exercise, uh, don't be sedentary. And then knowing your cycle and trying from five days before the probable ovulation, okay, and trying every one or two days. Mm -hmm. So having sexual intercourse every one or two days. Uh, we do know that there's no differences between coital positions. I would tell you be aware of natural signs of ovulation that you can that you can feel in your body. Also, we have apps, uh, LH tests, different things that we could use to try to to help us. But it, the truth is that it's uh, it's not have shown it didn't show a, a better outcome related to just a repeat intercourse during the six days of fertile window. And well, try to enjoy. And if it doesn't happen, then just uh, ask a doctor. And I think thank you and and good luck with trying. Once again, for joining us, and of course, sorry, I don't, I don't hear you now. I don't know if if everybody can hear you, Carla. Please let me know if anyone else has a problem. I hope now you will be able to hear me. Yes, yes. Now okay, we'll sorry. But I'm here, of course. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for the little mix-up when it comes to the presentation, uh, but of course, uh, it's all good, I hope. I was able to fix this later on, uh, <laughs> so you were able to see it. Uh, but of course, um, yeah, all is good, of course. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, Dr. Anna, as always, lots of questions are coming in. So um, let's not waste time and let's start with the questions, okay? Okay. Excellent. The first question from Margie is right here. So when in a cycle the follicles start growing, asking because some stimulation cycles sometimes start on day two, others on day three. So this is a good question, actually. There's no specific day of the uh, uh, follicle to start growing. It's true that um, in some uh, specific cases, we start stimulation when we do IVF, for example or also when we do uh, insemination before or later. Some, some, some people prefer to start at day two, depending on uh, every person we, we start on day three. Um, so it's something that it's not absolutely, we don't have a, a just uh, one day in which the, these uh, follicles starts to grow. Uh, so that's why actually more or less between day two and day three, there's not a big uh, differences. Uh, I think it depends a lot on the ovarian resource of the patient and on what we want to do. So with insemination, I would start uh, day three. And with uh, someone that, for example, wants to do an IVF with a, a low ovarian reserve, I would, I, I would start at day two okay, to avoid asynchrony of the follicles and things, things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much for the very first question, Margie. And let's have a look. Okay, we have more of those coming up. What uh, make many follicles grow during stimulation? The amount of FSH? How to define the FSH daily dosage based on the F AFC? How to make sure that the selection of dominant follicle doesn't take place and all the follicle grow? Okay, that are good questions. It's a uh, general IVF treatments, actually. So the thing is that um, what we have in a natural cycle is FSH that makes grow uh, a little bit different cycles when they are very small, okay? But then these FSH levels uh, start to decrease a little bit and just the follicle that is the dominant one because it has uh, more receptors for the FSH than the other ones, this one is going to keep all the FSH and this one is, is the one that's going to uh, be able to grow. So how do we do it to make more than one grow? Just giving more FSH. I mean, we give external FSH levels um, to, to try to, to, to give hormones for all the follicles, okay? Of course, it's not mathematics. It doesn't mean that even if we do uh, if, if we give you a correct uh, dose, all all them are going to grow because it depends a lot on the, on your response on every patient. It's it's very different, okay. But the thing is, we give more FSH to try to make all of them grow, okay. Uh, 
okay, within a security for the patient, of course. Um, and um, how to define the FSH uh, that we give daily, like with injections, with, with IVF treatments, or even with insemination, because in insemination we can also give a little bit of stimulation to try to increase um, the outcomes. Um, this is based on different things. The antral follicle count, uh, the age, the, the, the weight, the body mass index, okay, which is also important. And also if you have done previous cycles, so we can have an idea, but if you, for example, have uh, done another cycle that went well or wrong, or that this can give us an um, idea of how to change it and, and which dose do you need or which kind of medication doesn't work with you. Okay, so how to make sure that this selection of the dominant follicle doesn't take place so that we can make all of them grow? So giving more hormones, uh, more FSH levels, Starting the stimulation soon, I would say, more in people that have a low ovarian reserve, because when we have low ovarian reserve, we have, naturally, we have higher uh, levels of FSH, okay, because the fuel is higher, okay, for the ovaries. So that means that mostly what happens when we have low ovarian reserve and high FSH levels, the cycle shortens. And why does the cycle shorten? Because the Follicular growth starts before that it should, so before the menstruation, okay? And this can lead to um, a process in which we stimulate your ovaries, but one uh, follicle has already been selected, okay? And then we have what's called the asynchrony, even if we are giving you a lot of, of or enough FSH. So to manage that, normally we give a preparation before the menstruation, before starting uh, the IVF treatments, if we think it is necessary, and it depends on, on every case and on every patient. And again, thank you so much for yet another definitely um, interesting question, and of course for your explanation to this one. Um, okay, and I guess let's have a look at the next question. So what is the uh, normal life of fertility? 26, 27 is okay? Uh, the normal normal would be more between 18 and 25. Um, after 25, there's a little bit of overweight, but it's not uh, something that has been demonstrated that it can have an impact. So what we do know is less than 18 or could have an impact. More than 30 could have an impact. And actually, the best thing would be uh, having a 25 maximum, but 26, 27, actually, there's no... Um, conclusive evidence that says that this can have an impact, okay? So probably it's not going to, to, to be a, a bad BMI, okay? But it's also important is to do um, a healthy lifestyle and do exercise, okay? Even if we have um, a, a little bit of overweight and it can also help in that sense. Understood, thank you so much uh, for the clarification here. Um, okay, Angela has another question. So what is the chance of having any good eggs at 44 and AMH of 11? 11, I uh, probably it's talking about back moles, I think. So um, actually the thing is, the probabilities of having good eggs uh, with 44 years old are very low. Okay, so what we do know is that actually after the age of 43, we or, and actually with 43 also already, we start to recommend our patients to go for egg donation. Why? Because we know that the probabilities of having um, a success are very low, okay, uh, less than 5%. It is true that it depends on every patient. It depends, of course, on the age amount, everything, but it's something that... Um, I mean, we have to be very clear. Quality goes related with age, and this is the reason why uh, we know that the, the probabilities will be low. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing is that we cannot test the quality, as I, as I told you. So um, probably if you have a good ovarian reserve um, with 44 years old, I mean, probably I would ask you for more, more tests, the FSH levels, the alpha follicle count. I would test more things to see um, how everything is. I would also take in consideration if you have done treatments before or for how long you have been um, looking, okay, because it can give you 
also ideas, okay? But still, I mean, um, we do know that after uh, 43, it's, uh, the quality becomes um, much worse, okay? And the probabilities of having good eggs are less than 5%. All right, again, thank you so much for that explanation. And let's have a look, okay. Next one is a bit of a longer question. Um, could you please let me know what it means if there is a positive result for cytomegalovirus of 132.2 positive, also positive for chlamydia, um, when 1.1 is positive and erythrocytes is 10.5, when the range is 5.9, 9.90 in a pregnant woman? Okay, <laughs> so let's start. Let's start. Yes, of course. Face by face. Um, um, so, part of, step by step. Sorry. So, um, let's see. First thing uh, is it's very important. Um, I mean, probably you're pregnant, and then they have done all this um, this test on you, this this blood test. So, one thing that is important is also the the, the symptoms. If you have any symptom or any problem, it's just a, a normal, probably a normal blood test. What we look at, when we look at the cytomegalovirus, the cytomegalovirus is a virus that um, can have a big impact uh, if you get it uh, being uh, pregnant, okay? So what we look at is the IgG antibodies, okay? And the IgM antibodies, okay? So actually, if you have IgG antibodies that are positive uh, before the pregnancy, it means that an IgM negative it means that you are immunized, so that you had this cytomegalovirus virus before, years before, months before, okay, and that you are immune to it, okay. Um, this is something, it's, it's a virus that is um, very typical in, in children that go to the kindergarten, okay, so very little children, and probably you, you got that before, uh, it, could, it could be because uh, of one child that you had before, or it could be because you had it when you were uh, a child, okay. Um, so actually, uh, with just an IgG positive test, if the IgM is negative, it means that you're immune for it, so uh, that you don't have this high risk of getting it, during pregnancy, okay? There's also the possibility of reactivation, but this is a low probability of having an impact uh, on the baby, okay? And it's also not very frequent. So um, actually in this sense, it is correct. Then um, positive for chlamydia when it was, uh, it could have, I mean, there are different tests for chlamydia, so it, it could be something that you had in the past, okay? For sure, I will counsel to, to look at it with your obstetrician, so to look at everything super carefully and look if everything is correct, okay? To, for the chlamydia, normally it's, it's better to do a PCR test uh, in the cervix because it's more accurate and because uh, chlamydia can, some uh, antibodies of chlamydia can stay positive because you had it in the past, for example, or it can be also that there are some cross reactions and, and it's a false positive. Um, but it's something that we should look at, okay? I think uh, it's just because you had it probably in the past, but it depends on exactly on which test they have done and, and all uh, your signs and everything, okay? But probably it's something uh, about the past. And, and then about the erythrocytes, um, I think it's not a very important thing about the erythrocytes. It, we know that during pregnancy, but Again, I would contact my my obstetrician and hear what what he or she needs uh, needs to what what he thinks about it. Okay, what we do know during pregnancy is that we normally have a, a change in, uh, in the hemogram mm -hmm. that we can have more anemia. Okay, or actually the levels of, of hemoglobin, for example, uh, lower down a little bit. So that's also reason why during pregnancy normally. Um, also, it's something that we can do after the second uh, trimester or, or from the second trimester and on, we can take a little bit of iron supplements mm, for, for, the, for the hemogram that we also uh, think that it's important. Thank you for the detailed question indeed, and of course for detailed answer to it as well. Okay, let's have a look at the next question, this time a shorter one, could beta blocker affect fertility in women? 
I'm not sure about it. I didn't read about uh, beta blockers affecting fertility, so I, I think probably not that it doesn't have uh, an impact on fertility in women. But I probably should uh, look a little bit more data about it. Um, but if I if I had to say something, I would say probably not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, of course, understood. Thank you for that. And there's a thank you from Angela from our previous patient and regards to the previous okay. question, of course. Um, okay, next one is right here. So could painkiller drug like ibuprofen taken for a short time affect fertility? Mm. So this is interesting because sometimes um, it could affect the ovulation. Hmm? It could have an impact on the ovulation, it's true, because the, all the process that takes place in the ovulation and in the endometrium and everything needs some different uh, metabolism and, and chemicals from the body, okay, to release this egg uh, from, the, from the follicle. All this needs a lot of process with prostaglandins and different things, okay. And it's true that um, ibuprofen um, stops the, the prostaglandins, so it could have a, an impact. I think, I mean, probably it's not... Uh, very important, but normally we try to, we, we, we tell our patients to avoid ibuprofen during fertility treatments, okay, for that kind of, of reasons. Probably in a natural cycle if you're trying at home and if you take one day ibuprofen, I mean, it would be bad luck that it affects a lot, okay, at this cycle. Mm -hmm. But um, but we do know that when we are doing assisted reproductive techniques, sometimes we recommend, I mean, not sometimes, we recommend to, to try to avoid ibuprofen. All right, thank you so much for the clarification, of course, to this one as well. Okay, next one is definitely something we hear quite often. How fast does AMA drop after 39 each year? That's a good question. It's a very good question. I mean, we do know that uh, AMH drops, but it depends on every patient. So um, we don't know if you're the one that's going to have a big drop in, um, in one year or in six months. Um, probably there will be a drop, but not uh, very, very important uh, with the 39, but still it depends on every patient. Um, and the more time that, uh, that goes on, I mean, with 40, 41, 42, every time this drop is faster, okay? Um, sometimes people ask me, like, when they have low ovarian reserve, they ask me, is it that I had a very fast drop? Or that or what happened so we cannot know if they had like a very fast drop or if they have uh, from the basal they have um, less ovarian uh, reserve okay from the beginning of their lives and same thing with that so we don't know how fast your AMH will will drop after 39 each year uh, but probably I mean if you if you're thinking of, of trying to conceive I will strongly recommend you to start already okay um, to avoid any any other problems with, with, the, with this decrease of ovarian reserve. All right, thank you for that. Definitely helpful. Um, okay, let's have a look. Next question is here uh, from Anna this time. Uh, every month during ovulation, I get bladder pain and heavy do abdominal pain lasting two days. I never had that before. Would, what would be the cause of that? Would this prevent implantation? Hmm. So that's a good question. I mean, um, during ovulation, um, all this, um, there, there's like a movement of the genital tract. Also, there can be some contraction or or maybe when you ovulate, um, there's like a, a little bit of um, the ovaries is like, you know, moving a little bit and this creates a little bit of abdominal discomfort. Um, Actually, if you have heavy abdominal pain for two days or you have like uh, bladder pain, all these things probably are related to this ovulation, to a not, not normal uh, ovulation, but something has happened with your, uh, with your body because uh, we are always changing. Okay, so it's probably something interesting to look at. I mean, to do an ultrasound with your gynecologist to make sure that everything is correct that there's no cyst or no other thing that could be giving you this, this pain, okay? Um, and if everything is correct, I would say body changes a lot and, uh, and, and the anatomy changes also, so it can, it can vary a little bit. And some patients uh, tell me that 
um, when they have had uh, children, then after having one child, then they have uh, worse uh, pain of the menstrual pains or ovulation. So this is because the body uh, is continuously uh, moving and, and changing a little bit. Okay, so it, it can it can it can be that. But absolutely, I would check it with my gynecologist to make sure that everything is correct and and that's it. Okay. Okay, of course. Thank you so much for that advice. Um, okay, more questions. Like three questions are left. We will be slowly finishing. Uh, so if you have anything else to add, just go ahead and type those in. And the question is, is it normal to have progesterone levels fluctuate between 12, 18 nanograms per millimeter, four to seven days post peak fertility? Yes, it's something that we know that we can see because um, when we have this uh, progesterone uh, created from the corpus luteum, it is because uh, the central nervous system gives some uh, pulses of LH continuously also, and there's like a, um, uh, these pulses during the luteal phase are variating, and this can create a variation uh, of uh, the progesterone levels, okay? But I would say if it's more than six, um, uh, it is telling us that you've ovulated, okay? And actually, these are correct levels of, of progesterone. Okay, so don't worry about that. All right, thank you for that. And of course, there's a thank you from the patient for you right here. And um, yeah, next question again, a short one. So is low carb diet good for fertility? It's a good question. I mean, I think um, what you should have is a, is a normal carb diet, okay? Not excessive, also not a low carb diet, okay? I think the most regulated one um, with a lot of, of food, a lot of, of, of varied food, fresh food more than, um, than processed foods, as I, I told you before. Um, and probably what I tell you, better a normal carb diet than, than a low carb diet. I'm not an expert on, on nutrition, eh? I have to say, but that's what we normally recommend and that's what the, the evidence uh, tells us. All right, excellent. Thank you so much for that. And one more here. I was giving, um, I was given ibuprofen of her after egg retrieval as painkiller, it was a egg retrieval cycle only at the time, so it won't have any impact on fertility? No. I mean, uh, if you have it like once and after the egg retrieval, I think it's, it's not having a, a big impact uh, on the quality, on the fertility, okay? Um, also, it has a, it's a little bit controversial if it has an impact or not on endometrium. Um, but if it's, it was just only at the time, I mean, it's not something that's going to change. Um, and actually, a lot of clinics give a, a high ibuprofen also or um, some other kind of, of, uh, of uh, medications. And it, it's not clearly um, demonstrated that it has a, a big, big impact, okay? It could have an impact on, for example, the ovulation process in, in more in natural fertility, but after the retrieval and once, I don't think it's, it's important. All right. Thank you for the clarification once again. And the uh, next one is right here. So at which week, week in pregnancy should one expect to baby, the baby to start kicking? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, so if it's your first kicking, it's like, you know, with the legs and that, right? I'm understanding it correctly. Kicking is, is moving and that you feel it, right? Yes, moving. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, if it's your first uh, baby, normally it's later. It's like tw at the 20, 24 week. Okay, and it could be even even later. Don't worry about that. Uh, in some cases, some, some patients tell us um, that they have uh, feel it before with 17, 18 weeks. It depends also um, in the um, in, in in the weight of the person and in on where the the placenta is because if it's the placenta is anterior. Um, so the baby needs to do a very big um, movement so that you can feel it because the placenta is in between you and, and the baby, okay? Um, um, but probably I would say um, with the first child, 20, 24 weeks. With second child, it normally is before. 
it is before. Huh? But it depends also on where the, the placenta is. All right, of course, again, thank you so much for that uh, confirmation. And uh, one more from Angela, okay? Let's have a look. At which week in pregnancy should good quality fish oils, white caught and tiny, be stopped before the birth? I have read conflicting information on this. So I'm not aware of, of that. I mean, um, what I do know is that uh, some supplements have uh, good quality oils, okay? Um, and, and actually that, uh, for example, the omegas and all these things are very, very good during pregnancy um, and that um, have not uh, any, any bad impact on, on the pregnancy. And actually, I know that uh, a lot of the supplements of, of pregnancy have this also. Um, I'm not sure uh, about wild cup and tiny uh, because I don't, I don't know exactly, but um, I will look at that. I cannot help you a lot with that uh, with that question um, because I, I don't know actually a lot about that. I will take uh, take a look on that. Well done. Mm -hmm. Of course, thank you so much indeed uh, for uh, that. So once again, someone is typing. So let's have a, a minute and see if we have another question. Or yeah, it is. So let's have a look at this straight away. So is drinking coffee a bad idea when trying to conceive? Is drinking coffee my idea when trying to conceive? Well, I mean, uh, I would say between one and two coffees, it's not, uh, uh, it, it probably doesn't have an, an important role. Actually, caffeine um, and ca coffee has also antioxidative um, uh, effects, okay, so antioxidants, so it could also be good. But I mean, um, about caffeine, that's what we would say, like, Probably one or two coffees with caffeine a day would not uh, be a problem when trying to conceive, and neither when you when you become pregnant during pregnancy. One, two coffees a day should be okay. All right. Again, thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, there is a follow up. Uh, sorry, there is a thank you from Anna first. And uh, we will go back to the previous question from Angela. Yeah, so some say 32 weeks, other 36 weeks, so a big gap. Uh, that would be about the first uh, question, right? About the oil. Yes, exactly. Sorry, uh, I don't know. I will take a look, on, a look on that because I probably don't understand correctly what you're meaning. Okay, yes, Angela has added, yes, um, okay. All right, so we will need to leave this uh, leave this at the moment, but of course, I think now we will have uh, our final question, okay? If, uh, if you wish to ask anything else, go ahead and do it now. We can still answer some of your questions, but uh, let's have a look. So what is the age limit for treatment in your clinic with own eggs and also donor eggs? Okay, so um, let's start with the, with the easy answer, which is the, with donor eggs and general treatments. Um, it's up to 50 years of the day before you become 51 years old, okay? But I would strongly, strongly recommend you to avoid um, to wait that much and to go for a pregnancy before, eh? even if you're using an um, uh, egg donor, okay? Because pregnancy can, uh, I mean... Uh, uh, a pregnancy after 40 years or after 45 years uh, can be a high-risk pregnancy uh, and, and you can have uh, more preterm deliveries, uh, hypertension problems, uh, uh, diabetes problems. So I would strongly recommend you to try to conceive before, okay, I mean to, to get pregnant before, conceive or with egg donation, okay. But the limit is uh, 50, okay, then that's like a consent that we have, we have all the clinics in, in Spain, okay, 50 years and um, so until the day before 50, becoming 51. And then um, age limit for treatment with uh, own eggs. Um, so there's not um, uh, a limit limit that I would say, but I would not recommend it with 44 and 45, okay, so absolutely not with 46 years. Um, and with 44 and 45, mm, I mean, 44, we could uh, try if you had a very, very high ovarian reserve. And if, uh, I mean, oh, 
taking into consideration all the history, everything that you've done before, and I probably would recommend you to go for egg donation, okay? But if you have a very high reserve, you, I mean, patients have very high reserve with 44, eight, um, years old sorry um we could try it depends on every and every case and every patient um 45 would be a super high limit i mean uh, 46 i would not uh, do it i think but i mean it depends on 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 every patient and every case uh, we have to be always very clear i always explain very clearly what i recommend and what are the uh, what you can expect of the treatment because it's very important to know what you can expect um, and then uh, decide. But still with 46, I think it's too much. And 45, mm, probably it depends a lot on on, um, on the variant reserve and, and, and all the history, okay? I think 44 would be more or less the, the limit. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much indeed for that. This is something that also comes up quite often as well. Um, okay, one more question here from Angela. Can Spain export embryos made from donor eggs but has been sperm to Australia or other countries? Um, actually, I, don't, I think, for example, if you do a treatment here, uh, and, and you do egg donation, we create the embryos and then uh, later there's some kind of problem and and you want to to take your embryos with you i mean they are yours okay so i don't think there's a problem with that uh of course it depends on a lot of legislation things that probably my bosses will <laughs> know better than me about administrative part and that kind of things but normally for us it's not a problem okay if, if something happens and, and you don't want to proceed into the embryo transfer here uh, it's it's yours i think it, it would not be a problem and also i don't know if, if australia has a regulation on that so i cannot i cannot answer to that but normally when i i have these kind of questions in in my visits i just ask my the ones that uh, do all this uh, more administrative and legal part and we go through it and we just tell you okay but i mean I think for us it's not a problem um, if, if you have or, or, or you have your eggs here, for example, frozen, and then you want to take them uh, to another country. I don't see why you could not do it. Okay, but again, I mean, I don't know if I'm missing something. Um, so it's something that we always have to talk with. Uh, with, uh, with yes, of course. Part. Actually, Angela has added some info. Uh, Australian is the name of the donor because it's not anonymous for import. Uh, if the numbers. No, no, then it would not be possible because here, I mean, egg donation is totally anonymous. You cannot know uh, the name of the donor, so it would be impossible to give you the name of the donor. Exactly. So I guess this is the part where it's impossible simply because, of course, the legislation is different between Spain and Australia. Then. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. All right, of course. Thank you still for, for the clarification here. Okay, um, okay. Um, if you can have a look at this, so what will be a high AMH at 44? Well, there's a follow up. Sorry, let me just uh, uh no, sorry, <laughs> let's go to this one. Sorry, at 44, uh, probably talking about nanograms per milliliter with 44, two nanograms per milliliter would be a super good uh, AMH. Uh, talking about nanograms milliliter, I'm used to do it like that, not with picomoles. I always have to convert it uh, to, to see exactly the levels of nanograms. So talking in, in nanograms, it would be, um, two would be a super good. Uh, 1.5 would, would be also a very good uh, number with with your age, okay? Um, and actually with, with 44, uh, the AMH would be much lower than that, okay? But a high AMH would be like two, uh, 1.5 or 2 would be a uh, height AMH for 44 years old. Probably less than that, eh? All right, of course. Thank you so much indeed. And I already showed you, I was, uh, I thought that it's the same patient, but it's a different patient. Anna has added AMH 35, age 39. Is this sufficient or too low? I have always to convert this to, to my, my, um, to the nanograms. Do you have it in nanograms? 
I think it would be um, a good amount. I'm trying to account it. Uh, I think it's a good amount with 39. Um, but still, I would look at it carefully with my with my, my calculator and, and, and look at it if it's correct. I mean, just that you know, what's a high AMH and what's a low AMH? When talking about nanograms, okay, sorry, because I have this, uh, the nanograms in my, in my head. But when we talk about nanograms per milliliter, uh, low ovarian reserve would be less than 1.2 or 1, okay. Um, and a optimal ovarian reserve would be more than 2.5 nanograms per milliliter. Which that would be a very good uh, AMH. But for, for, for example, we have a different kind of patients. And for example, with PCOS patients, we have very high uh, AMHs. Um, much higher than that, even four or five. I have seen one of seven nanogram per milliliter, which is very, very high. Okay, so it depends a little bit on on all the history. Okay, but in general, um, the AMH level um, we look at them regarding also to to knowing these these levels of the AMH, and of course we do know that they vary uh, between ages, that they vary between labs. So it's not clear. It's not easy to say um, a direct number with, um, with 39, 38, 40. There's a lot of data and, and it's, it's, uh, there's not a consensus to say this is more or less. But what in, with, in, in which we have a consensus is uh, that uh, less than 1.2 or less than 1 should, would be a low variant reserve, a low AMH, and more than 0.4. Point, uh, 2.5 would be a very high and optimal of our end reserve. Okay, so the normal range would be around those between. All right, thank you indeed for that uh, once again. And we will be finishing, okay? Someone is typing, uh, so let's have a look. But of course, we do have already some uh, thank yous. Yeah, it's a thank you from the patient for you right here. One is the patient, and there's the second one, and there's another one here. Uh, so thank you so much indeed for uh, for that. We will be finishing. Uh, but of course, remember that if you wish to get some more details from Dr. Ann and her team, you know what to do you will be redirected to um to dr anna's um profile on our website but of course i'm sure you can also reach to her and her team and i'm sure more than sure that they will be happy to help you out with any questions that you might have and uh, one more thank you for you dr anna from our patient thank you very much for a great presentation detailed answers yes what thank you very much this is something I, I would like to say exact. It, it's exactly the same. I mean, uh, so um, before I let you go, Dr. Anna, anything else you would like to add? Nothing. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. I hope to to have explained it as clear as possible because my English is, is not perfect. So uh, sometimes it's a little bit more tricky to, to explain things in another language. Um, and if you need anything of us, uh, I mean, I would be uh, happy to answer more, more questions if you have it. I will look at the uh, thing about the oil <laughs> also. And, and well, and nothing, I hope that uh, it was clear and that it was a little bit useful. It was definitely a brilliant session. So thank you so much for everyone for all of your questions, because, you know, uh, I love this back and forth question answer thing simply because, you know, there are so many questions that you have. And sometimes uh, you can surprise with those questions, right, Dr. Anna? Those questions yes. can be quite surprising. So uh, so we are even more happy when we get that, because, of course, that means um, we can help you a bit and also find out a bit more on other things ourselves, I guess, as well, in a way. Uh, so thanks a lot for that. And of course, as you know, we will be back here tomorrow at uh, 8 p.m. UK time. There is another topic. Now we will start with May reproduction uh, topics. I'm, I'm very happy to be able to, to um, provide you with all those topics uh, that uh, are coming up very, very soon, starting from tomorrow. Uh, and Dr. Anna, once again, thank you so much for, uh, uh, for joining us, for your answers. And it's been
great to have you back for sure. And as Thank always, you. remember it has been recorded, so you will have a chance to watch this once again on IV, my Ivy Offenses. As you know, there are like over 300 IVF webinars already on our site, so there are plenty of topics to choose from. So if you want to find out some more, go ahead and check it out. And uh, well, as you know, plenty of more events are coming up also starting from tomorrow. So go to our Facebook or Instagram and you will be able to see uh, some other topics. And uh, another one, another doctor from Repro Clinic will be with us actually next week. So also just have a look and check it. Uh, so thank you so much once again. Take care, everyone. Have a lovely and relaxing evening, Dr. Anna. A pleasure as always. Thank you so much. Thank you Bye. very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.